Animals have evolved extraordinary adaptations to fit their environment, but they're not perfect. Designers can go back to the drawing board. Evolution is condemned to modify what's already there. So nature is full of compromises and imperfections. Creationists also ask how something so apparently perfect as the eye just sprang into existence. Well, it didn't. The basic chemistry that makes up a light-sensitive cell is shared right across the animal kingdom and natural selection has seized on this time and time again. Science has uncovered species at every stage in the evolution of the eye. It is a cumulative process and each step of the way is more useful than the one before. The eye has evolved independently at least 40 different times around the animal kingdom and it has evolved gradually improvement on improvement and yet Randy, you and I are both Darwinians, obviously, but you're a medical doctor and I'm not. Mm -hmm. It's always struck me that a lot of medical doctors don't seem quite to have caught up 150 years after the origin. Is that your impression too? They're all very interested once they find out about it, um, but very few doctors have had a chance to get an education in evolutionary biology, and boy, do I ever wish I had <laughs> yes. uh, when I was uh, to getting my medical education. There are so many things that would have made a lot more sense if someone had just really explained how natural selection works. There are some doctors who feel, well, all I need to do then is to learn about a lot of other animals as though I was a vet, but it's not quite like that, is it? No, we really need to know where they all came from and why they're all designed in ways that make things go wrong. So you use the word design there, and yes. um, we need, to, obviously, to interpret that in the special Darwinian sense of You know, design. I always end up using the word design, and someone in the audience always said, you shouldn't do that, Dr. Nessie, because yeah. uh, you don't really mean design, and they're absolutely right, of course. Well, yeah, but... We've grown out of that now, haven't we, or but, have we not? But when you look at how the mechanisms of the body work, it's almost automatic to talk about them being designed, but really gives the proof is when you look at how badly designed they are. No sensible person would have ever left the body the way it is. Like what? What's a good example of that? Um, name your part of the body that you want to. Um, probably a lot of people watching this uh, show have been on a skateboard. And, for instance, they fall like this, and they break these bones here. The doctors call it a Collie's fracture. If you look on the skeleton, it's these two bones fracture right there. Now, people have been falling down like that for, you know, a million years, or our predecessors have. Why didn't natural selection make these bones thicker? And the answer is this. We can do this marvelous thing of rotating our arms all the way around like that. I won't do it for this model because it's a Victorian skeleton that's quite <laughs> delicate. But notice how those bones go across oh, yeah. each other. If those bones were thicker, it would be more like this. Yeah. And then you yeah. couldn't throw. You, yeah. you, so it's a trade-off, isn't it? Now, this is something that any machine would be limited by. But when they make robots, they still are not using two different firm rods, usually. There's usually one that rotates. OK, so it's, a, it's kind of historical legacy, then. That's the other part of it. Yes, yes exactly. Historical legacy. We, the technical word term is path dependence. It's all the same. Yeah. Probably a lot of viewers have a keyboard for their computer. In fact, we all have what's called a QWERTY keyboard. And that keyboard was designed specifically to keep typewriter keys from sticking. And so they put all the vowels a fair way away from each other, so there was a little delay. Well, this means we all type slowly because our keyboards yeah. are designed to make us there type slowly. There are better designs of keyboards. There are. What's what it called? The Dvorak. Uh, yes. And once you've learned how to do it, uh, you go faster, don't you? You first. Uh, I would, be the time it takes exactly, to learn. Exactly, exactly. I, that, I will never do that. I, don't, I think the world may be stuck with yes. these mal-designed keyboards for another hundred years just because they started off that way and the cost of changing is too high for all of us who so are stuck with it. Likewise, there are all kinds of aspects of the body that might be done differently, but uh, we've gone down one particular path and can't get out of it. I mean, the example I like to use with machines is imagine if you had to evolve the jet engine from the propeller engine by changing it one little step at a time. Not possible. Or if you did, you have a pretty lousy jet engine. Exactly so. What, what are other examples in the human body that are... The most dramatic is, is the human eye. Right. You know, it's held up as this example of perfection in the body. It's not perfect to guys. It's a perfect example of, of why the body is not designed. I mean, imagine a camera designer for a famous camera company like Nikon or Pentax who put the wires between the light and the film, which is how our eye is working. 
And not only that, our eye has a whole blind spot where nothing works at all. I think I th you know, do you know that every creationist has a blind spot? <laughs> and I think it was Helmholtz, the famous German psychologist, who said if somebody, had, if an engineer had given him the human eye, he'd yeah. have sent it back. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Um, I think viewers might like to see their own blind spots. Shall we demonstrate for them for just a moment? Okay. Yes. All you need um, to do the demonstration is a little pencil. You can do it just with an eraser, but this particular one has a little tiny red pin on the top. And what you do is cover one eye, if you would, please. And we take the pin and we move it right in the, and you have to keep looking right, right. at the bridge of my nose, so okay. keep your eye fixed. And now we're going to move it just out a little bit, about 15 degrees, and right about there. Yeah, it's gone. It's gone. Yeah. You can't see it? No. Now can you see it? Yes. Now can you see it? Yes. Now can you see it? No. There's a blind spot. Yeah. That's really lousy. Yeah. So what's amazing, though, about how natural selection has made the eye so it works despite this built-in flaw is that the eye constantly jiggles slightly. We call it nystagmus. And this seems like it's a problem, but it's actually a solution. Because if it wasn't for the eye jiggling constantly just a little bit, that blind spot would always be in the same spot. You'd never see anything there. But because the eye moves slightly, um, you end up getting a complete coverage of your field of vision. It is remarkable how natural selection manages to kind of clean up afterwards, isn't it? That's I mean, a lot of what it does. You start off it's with, stuck with things. With a, it's stuck with things for historical accident, but then the, the cleaning up afterwards is so good that it actually ends up a really remarkably fine instrument, despite it, its historical it, it's legacy. It's astounding, right. Yeah. I mean, with the eye, there are other things that happen later in life, like detached retinas, you know? Um, for us, as I said, all of the vessels and nerves come through that hole in the back of the eyeball. That's why there's a blind spot. And they spread out on the inside of the eyeball between the light and the place where the light is received, blocking the light. And that's why you have to have that little bit of jiggle in there. Uh, but that's for all mammals, in fact, all vertebrates. Not all species have this problem, interestingly. Mm -hmm. And if we can go over here to our octopus, I don't know if you can zoom in. All of the octopuses, the cephalopods, have an eye that's designed properly. Dare I use the design word again? Yeah. Um, their eyes have all of the vessels and nerves coming right through the back of the eyeball, so they can't get a retinal detachment. They never have a problem with the blind spot. They don't have to be moving the eye so much to get a complete field of vision. It's a better design absolutely entirely than ours. And the reason is, why are we so screwed up? Bad luck. Yeah. There's it's no right other the explanation origin, yes. except it's bad luck. Nevertheless, we probably see better than octopuses do because our cleaning up has been has Or been differently, so you know. Yes. That, that's another example of trade-offs. For instance, uh, an eagle can see a mouse from half a mile away, and we can't. Yes but they don't have the color vision we have, they don't have the field of vision that we have. Everything in the body, once you take an evolutionary view, is trade-offs all the way down. Okay, um, Darwin, this comes in here. Uh, Darwin seemed to express that the evolution of the eye was a hard case to explain, says the, e the person who emailed this in to me, Steve, I think it was. Do you have any cases yourself where there is uneasiness with this? Well. That's a famous quote from Darwin. Darwin said something like, to, to suppose that the eye, with all its intricate contrivances, he goes on in great detail about how complicated and, and beautiful the eye is, um, could, be, could, could come about as a result of, of evolution by natural selection, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Words to that effect. That quotation is very often given, but it, it isn't followed by what Darwin next said, which was to spend um, a, a good part of a chapter explaining exactly why actually it is explicable. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, it's a, it's a, in a way it's a good rhetorical technique to, as it were, offer something to your opponents um, before you then dis disillusion them. It, where it fails is if your opponents then take the offer and then don't quote what follows. So, um, the, so the eye is actually uh, very well explicable by evolution and I've explained it in especially two of my books, The Blind Watchmaker and Climbing Mount Improbable. Um, but that wasn't the question you asked me. You asked me the question, is there anything that I find particularly difficult? No, um, because that's not the way science works. We don't say this is a very difficult case, therefore God must have done it. Therefore, science can't explain it. Therefore, the supernatural must be wheeled in.
to explain it. That isn't the way we work. If science can't explain it, then we say, all right then, let's go to work. Let's see what we need to do, what new theories we need to bring into our science, how we need to change our science. Um, and uh, that technique has always worked so far. If there was something that I was genuinely puzzled about, then my response would not be, oh, it must be supernatural. My response would be, then in that case, we must roll our sleeves up and go to work to try to understand it. Right. Well, because to me, this is, apart from the e person who emailed us in, this is really, and I put it at the top of my list, because it's something that bothered me when I was growing up, that I, I thought, how could we have evolved? Because the eye is so complex. For example, we've got cameras in the studio here, and they need camera operators to, to pull focus and to be able to change shots and everything. And, and the more distance or close-up you get, you have to change uh, the, the actual iris of the, of the camera perhaps even open it or close it a little bit. So the, that's all done instantaneously within, from the, within the brain, the human brain. And it's so complex that I thought, yeah, how could we have been bumping around without sight for thousands or millions of years if we've evolved, when really it needed to be functioning from the word go? Well, yes, all right, I'll, I'll, I will answer that, that question. Um, certainly, you're absolutely right. The eye is a most remarkable organ, and it does the same sorts of things that these television cameras do. It does um, instant focusing. It does instant stopping down with the iris diaphragm. It's, it's got um, full color, three, three color vision, just like modern televisions uh, have. Um, and it is a remarkably beautiful, it's not totally flawless. There are interesting flaws, interesting imperfections, which actually are revealing. Nevertheless, it does work very well, and an engineer would um, give it somewhat high marks for being well, quote, designed. Now, you raise the question, doesn't it all have to be working before, it'll work, before it'll, it's any, any good? How could we bump along for millions of years with only half an eye? That's a bit of a fallacy, because actually um, only a quarter of an eye, only a hundredth of an eye, is better than nothing. You can make a, s a slowly climbing ramp of improvement from just the very rudiments of vision, just say being able to tell the difference between light and shade, nothing more than that, right up to the perfection of a human eye or the eye of a hawk, say. And in order for evolution to explain that, all, all we need is that there should be a, a ramp of improvement where every step, a hundredth of an eye, two hundredths of an eye, three hundredths of an eye, etc., fifty percent of an eye, fifty-one percent of an eye, each step has got to be an improvement on the one that went before. And it's easy to see why that would be. You start by being able to tell whether there's a shadow, whether it's night or day. Shadow's useful, it could be a predator moving overhead in the sea. Um, night or day is obviously useful for all sorts of purposes. Then you could imagine a cup um, instead of just having a flat sheet of light-sensitive cells, it just, the edges turn up into a cup. Now, the cup means that if there's light coming from that direction, it hits that part of the eye. If there's light coming from that direction, it hits that part of the eye. So already the animal can tell the direction from which light is coming and the direction from which a shadow is coming. So we, we haven't got an image yet. All we've got is the direction of light. Now the cup can steadily and slowly over evolutionary time close over until you end up with a little hole at the top. And the little hole at the top, the same principles working all the way, that light coming from that direction hits that part of the retina and from that direction hits this part of the retina. But because there's a hole, it's rather more precisely, not exactly focused, but um, light from there hits there, light from there hits there, light from there hits there, because it's got to get through the hole. We're moving towards a pinhole camera. Now, a pinhole camera, if you make the hole small enough, and remember we're having a smooth gradient of closing up the hole, if you make the hole small enough, then it makes a sharp, focused image. The trouble with a pinhole camera is that the image is very dim because very little light can get through the pinhole. What you need is a lens. Um, because what a lens does is gather light from different directions and focus it on a point. Instead of ha it having to go right through the middle of the hole, it can be gathered from a wider range of sources. 
Now, um, a lens is not difficult to arrange. Any old chunk of, set of transparent gubbins will do the job better than a pinhole. So once again, we've got a slow, gradual improvement. Any old lump of gubbins, transparent, is better than nothing. And then the lens simply improves its shape gradually, 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 gradually. It's got to be gradually. Every step has got to be a slight improvement over the previous one. You get a lens. Um, Can I just ask you though, Richard? Yes. Uh, how long did this process take? Well, that's very interesting. I mean, we, we've got um, hundreds of millions of years to play with because that's what geological time gives us. I mean, we've got maybe a billion years since the first eye, since the first focusing eye appeared. Um, what about the trilobite? Trilobites uh, uh, have very beautiful eyes. Um, and very, very clever. I mean, they're just, it's amazing. Uh, they, 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 ha they have compound eyes, which is what modern insects and crustaceans have. But the and trilobite has, um, in, in the fossil record, is exactly the same today as it was, or in that sense. It, it, it didn't evolve, it had, it, it well, had those lenses. Well, there are today. No, I mean, but um, it had the lens uh, mechanism, which is, is no, quite powerful. Well, well tri trilobites have, co have compound eyes, which is a very different principle and a very interesting principle. It's, it doesn't uh, focus quite as, um, as sharp an image as our eyes do, um, but it is a very beautiful thing. Um, and trilobites do go back um, hundreds of millions of years, 500 million years, half a billion years. Um, it must have taken um, some time before trilobites came on the scene, but even trilobites are relatively recent compared to the age of the Earth which is four and a half billion years old. Um, got, but obviously, of course, uh, as a creationist or believer in creation, the book of Genesis, you know, I would disagree with that. But uh, What would you disagree with? With the, the time. The ah, time how old do you think the world is then? I would say that uh, as, because I'm a Bible-believing yes. Christian, that I believe that the book of Genesis is, an, is in actual fact, uh, the, the record, because Christ has well referred often to the book of Genesis, that in the beginning, yes, yes. Uh, Adam and Eve, and I know that, mm. but before we get onto that, because we can come back to that, mm, all right. is that there is um, an email that came in with regards to the eye, which I, I'd like to, to read, because yes. it's, uh, it's quite intelligently written. Uh, in Richard's book, The Greatest Show on Earth, uh, and he gives the pages, etc., he claims the retina could not have been designed as creationists say, because the photoreceptors are at the back rather than the front so it is back to front and it was a fact he said if it was created it was the design of an idiot just, just stop there uh, recent research has shown that there are cells in the retina that guide light to the photoreceptors and refocus it the scientists who did this research described the light guiding cells in the retina structure with the words optimal design for improving the sharpness of images and that's from physical review letters etc etc um, will Richard admit he is wrong since he is not an expert on optics and the researchers are? Well, no, I will not admit I'm wrong. Um, this is a very interesting case. Um, the, the, the retina is back to front, and the retina of the vertebrate eye is back to front in the sense that the light-sensitive cells are pointing away from the light. Now, uh, the light-sensitive cells are connected to the brain via nerves, and any sensible designer would have had the nerves behind the light sensitive cells which is in fact the way they are in mollusks for example octopuses which have rather good eyes rather like ours with the difference being that the light sensitive cells point towards the light and the wires connecting it to the brain lead backwards to the brain which is the sensible way to do it now the vertebrate eye is back to front so that the wires that connect the light sensitive cells to the brain are running along the front of the retina that means that the light has to penetrate the, this forest of wires, nerves, before it hits the light-sensitive cells which are facing backwards. Now, it's very easy to see why this happened. It happened for historical reasons, and there's, there's no, no doubt about that. Now, it, it is, of course, true that humans, for example, and I mentioned hawks before, see much better than octopuses. So in spite of the fact that our eye has this design flaw, we have better eyes because natural selection comes along afterwards and cleans up after the original mess that was made by this fundamental design flaw. Natural selection came along afterwards and made all sorts of little titivations which have the effect of giving us really rather good vision. And that happens again and again. It's very interesting that you get a, a, a bungle to begin with 
and then rather than correct the bungle, what natural selection does is to come along and make little titivations, little tinkerings, which sort of make, make up for the, for the mistake. And that's a very in interesting um, phenomenon. I'd like to go back to the, the timing uh, yes. of when do you, you say that we uh, reached our optimum where we're at today? Uh, how far back would you have to go? Ten? Oh, I, I, I wouldn't use the word like or? optimum. I mean, I, what, I think... What well, because I, you think we're still evolving, obviously. Well, but where we're at today? Then. Well, well what, uh, what I'd prefer to say is that um, natural selection is constantly working and is, uh, the environment is constantly changing, um, if only because the, the predators, the enemies, the parasites uh, of any particular species are also evolving. And so you never really reach a sort of finished, settled optimum um, there's always more improvement that, that, that can happen. What about other parts of the body, which to me, I mean, as I say, just as a layman, um, I had to come to terms with, you know, how on earth did we function? And uh, the heart, for example, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, uh, and particularly, don't want to be too personal, but how do I take a leak if I have to wake up a few million years to do that? Wait a minute, I don't understand. <laughs> well, if I was to go to the toilet, you know, yes. I mean, how, did, how did we evolve uh, with the ability to uh, release uh, waste if we were waiting for certain organs to develop? Well, no, it's, it's not really like that. Um, I know it's a simple question, but, uh, but well, I'm a simple man. I mean, you don't, you don't wait millions of years. It, 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 it all happens. There's a, there's a continual improvement going on all the time, continual changing. I mean, the, the way things work is different now from the way it used to be. I mean, let me, I mean, I, I tried to give you a rather detailed exposition of the, of the, of the eye, and you switched to something else. I mean, did, did you find that convincing, what I said about the eye? Well, not really. <laughs> well, but I understand... Uh, well, I don't mean it because, uh, because but I, I gave you the, 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 the gradual ramp of improvement. What I didn't quite have time to say is that if you look around the animal kingdom today, and you mentioned trilobites, but um, there are lots and lots of animals which show eyes in all sorts of what we might think of as states of sort of half development. I mean, there are flatworms that have just a cup for an eye, no, no lens, not even a pinhole. There are animals like Nautilus, which is a sort of coiled up squid kind of thing um, in a shell, which has a pinhole camera for an eye. So each step of the way that I told you about m might have been hypothetical, but you can find an animal somewhere around the animal kingdom, a living animal, um, which actually does it. So I don't understand why you don't find that convincing. Well, let me tell you what, what happened in my brain at that particular right. moment in time was that I was thinking of the book of Genesis and where uh, God says that he made everything according to its kind. The eye. Charles Darwin himself said, to this day, the eye makes me shudder. Creationists are particularly fond of the eye because they like saying, what is the use of half an eye? An eye only works, they say, if every little detail is in place. Until you've got that, the eye won't see anything at all, so how can it possibly have evolved? And even serious scientists have sometimes queried whether there's been enough time for the evolution of the eye. Well, suppose we start with an ancestor who didn't really have an eye at all, but just a single, simple sheet of light-sensitive cells. That's represented by this screen here, and there's a television camera behind looking at the screen so that we on the screen, on the television screen, shall see what this primitive animal would see. So this animal, with hardly any eye at all, will at least be able to tell the difference between light and dark. Light and dark. Now, the next stage in evolution would be to have a shallow cup. This animal would be able to tell the direction that light is coming from, because there a shadow would appear. A shadow would appear there. And if you can tell the direction a light is coming from, then you can tell the direction that a predator is coming from. Now, although we've represented this as a cup coming out from the wall, it would in fact probably be an indentation, and it would be a gradual indentation. 
it's inconvenient to make a gradual indentation. It has to be made as a rather abrupt cup that comes out six inches at a time. But it's easy to see that that shadow effect that we've just been witnessing would work progressively and gradually as the cup gets bigger. Let's make it bigger still now, Bryson. And this cup is even more effective. And if we go on to the next stage where we make the cup gradually bigger again, so big that it becomes just a little hole in the end. Right now, this animal has a very good idea of exactly where the light is, and by the same token, exactly where, for example, a predator is. And I think with this eye, we might even get a little image. See if we can get an image of Bryson's hand. That smudge there is Bryson's hand, and you can just about see a very dim image of his fingers. So an animal with an eye like this would be able to see perhaps just a little bit what kind of predator it was. Let's go to the logical conclusion, which would be a pinhole. Remember, this is all gradual, gradual change in evolution. Right, let's see if we can see your hand again, Bryson. Now I can see a rather precise picture of Bryson's hand. It's not a very bright one, but I can see every finger clearly delimited. So I could see, if I were this animal, I could see my predator in some detail. There is an animal that has a pinhole camera for an eye. It's a mollusk called Nautilus. It's a relative of the octopus, but it lives in a shell. And there is its eye. It just has a simple hole, and seawater can flow in and out of that hole. Here's a shell of Nautilus. This bit of rock here shows ammonites, which are a now extinct relative of Nautilus. They were once immensely common, as this rock suggests. I like to think of all those hundred million year old dramas that must have been witnessed through the pinhole camera eyes of ammonites. We can't be sure they had pinhole camera eyes, but it seems quite likely. Now, a pinhole camera is not a very good way of seeing. It does produce a sharp image, but because it's so narrow, you hardly get any light in. The answer to this problem is that ingenious device, the lens. Nautilus has a pretty poor eye compared with its relatives, the squids and octopuses, because they do have a lens. And so we can't help wondering, why doesn't Nautilus have a lens? Why didn't it evolve a lens? Well, I suspect that Nautilus may have got itself stuck on a little peak some way up Mount Improbable. You see that although we've got one big peak there, there are various other peaks on the way. There are quite a lot of them. And since the rule in evolution is just to keep going uphill, when the ancestors of Nautilus came up the track here, up the path here, and got to this point, that way uphill looked just as inviting, so to speak, evolutionarily, as that way. Both of them were uphill. Evolution has no foresight. Evolution has no way of knowing that if you travel up that way, you're going to end up with a lens. For the moment, this appears to be a perfectly good way to travel because the pinhole camera at this level of illumination is an effective eye. So I wonder whether perhaps Nautilus has got itself trapped on top of this little hillock and is now unable to escape because escaping would mean going downhill into the valley. And the one thing you cannot do on Mount Improbable is ever go downhill. But let's imagine what the ancestors of the squid and octopus did when they got to this junction point here. They just happened to go on up this way. And they started evolving a lens. And we did at a different time in history. How might the lens have evolved? Well, let's imagine that it started with just a single transparent sheet of some transparent material. And all that this was doing, it's not a lens yet, all that it's doing is protecting the eye. In Nautilus, seawater flows right inside the eye. This animal now has some protection. And the eye is really just the same as, as though there wasn't any transparent material there. Now, we're going to use an 
uh, optician set of lenses here, it would be nice to be able to have just one bit of transparent material which we would then squeeze and make thicker. But we can't do that, so we're going to replicate that effect by a whole series of little lenses. So this is the next stage in evolution. This animal here, let's get a, an image of that. Okay, that's a rather better and above all brighter image of the hand. Let's have the next lens in. Right, now, if an animal that had an eye like that would have a really very, very clear view of its world, it could tell exactly uh, what its predator was. Would anybody like to come out and have their face looked at? <laughs> right, yes. What's your name? Davina. Say it again. Davina. Davina. Now, can, did you remember where Bryson put his hand? Can you put your face just down there? We need the lights down, I think, for this, don't, don't we? There we are. Very nice. This, this animal can even see what its predator's face looks like. Upside down, but we all see upside down. Thank you very much, Davina. So we have a gradual pathway all the way up Mount Improbable from no eye to an eye. But has there been enough time for the evolution of the eye? Well, recently a Swedish scientist called Dan Nielsen has tried to answer that question. He did pretty much the same as we've just been doing here, but he did it with a computer. So instead of growing up in big steps, as we had to do with our wooden model, he was able to do it in very small steps on his computer. In fact, very small steps indeed, deliberately. He assumed that each step, which means each mutation, caused only a 1% change in the size of something, like, say, the steepness of a cup. He also devised a way of measuring the efficiency of an eye. He did this by telling the computer to measure various things about the eye that it had just drawn itself. And then the computer worked out, using the rules of physics, how good an image that eye would be capable of producing. And the question was, with those rules built into it, would there be a smooth gradient of improvement, starting out with a flat retina and ending with a proper eye like ours? And you've guessed it, the answer is yes. This was Nielsen's starting point with just a flat retina under a flat transparent layer. And now let's just run the simulation of... These are the successive stages that Nielsen got, and they're pretty similar to the successive stages that Bryson got with his model. So, so far we haven't learned anything that we didn't already know. There is a smooth progression, upmount improbable, for the eye. But Nielsen went on to estimate how many generations it would take to accomplish this evolution. In order to do this, he had to make some more detailed assumptions. I won't bother you with exactly what they were. All you need know is that they were quantities which geneticists out in the field can measure and have measured. And Nielsen put into his computer model values of these quantities that were conservative. Conservative means that he was erring on the side of deliberately bi biasing his calculation to make it slow, to give it an estimate on the slow side of evolution. Make evolution come out slower than it might otherwise have done. But in spite of this, in spite of his being conservative, and in spite of assuming that each mutation could only cause a 1% change, which is another conservative assumption, Nielsen found that the evolution of the eye, we've just seen, would take a surprisingly short time. It would take about 250,000 generations. Well, that might sound like quite a lot of generations, but we have a rather warped perspective, because, after all, each one of us is only good for one generation. But our human perspective is not the one that matters. The one that matters is the geological timescale. And on the geological timescale, 250,000 generations is next to nothing, probably only about a quarter of a million years, since the animals we're talking about will probably have had a generation time of about a year. And a quarter of a million years is really too short for geologists to even measure. It's like trying to count seconds using the hour hand of your watch. 
So there really was no need for Darwin to shudder. Half an eye is better than no eye. Half an eye is better than 49% of an eye. 1% of an eye is better than no eye at all. And far from there not being enough time for the evolution of the eye, the evolution of the eye is so quick and easy that it must have happened many, many times over. Eyes can evolve at the drop of a hat. And in fact, if we look around the animal kingdom, there are lots of different kinds of eyes dotted around, and each of them is different. Many of them work on completely different principles, and they have evolved quite independently of each other, many times over. This is the shell of a scallop, a kind of shellfish. These things are not pearls, they're eyes. <coughs> but they're a very different kind of eye from anything we've seen and anything that we normally think about. Those eyes are reflector eyes. They have mirrors instead of lenses. Each one of these is a little curved mirror which works like the Jodrell Bank telescope and forms an image in the way that a reflecting telescope does, not in the way that our eyes do. Uh, this is a compound eye of an insect. Each one of these little facets is one little eye and the whole assembly together is interpreted by the brain to make one big image. Next eye, next one. These headlights belong to a spider. Once again, this is entirely independent evolution of the eye. It's nothing to do with the other eyes that we've seen. And next, and finally the eye of a squid. Uh, this is the skin of a squid, there's its eye. The squid has a very excellent eye, very like ours, with a proper lens, proper camera principle. But you can tell by looking at the details of it, especially how it develops, that it evolved entirely independently of ours. The same principle was hit on entirely independently of ours. Once again, remember that each step is a small piece of random luck. As such, each step is not particularly impressive. In fact, it had better not be impressive, because if it was, it would be a miracle, and we'd no longer have a true explanation. The whole point of evolution is that it gets us up Mount Improbable without miracles. <laughs>so our botched compromised bodies are themselves evidence of evolution. They're shot through with history. Evolution is a fact. It's documented by science to the same degree Napoleon is by history. Some things are just true. They're not a matter of choice or opinion. But you'd never guess that in the place where this matters more than anywhere, in our schools where the teaching of evolution has become a hugely sensitive issue for science teachers.